Welcome. The following video or audio are the study of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse of the King James 1611 Bible. Our family welcomes you to our household Bible ministry time. You may watch and listen with us. Our goal has been from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Each chapter by chapter we try. And topical preaching and teaching aids you can find by searching different topics. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Come and appreciate the word of God for our spiritual growth, our development in the word of God by these lessons. Please feel, feel, please feel welcome to upload and share our Bible study with family and friends. Like us, subscribe, write a comment, let us know you heard the message. The video or audio are not copyrighted and should be used and not abused. Thank you. First John chapter 4 Beloved, believe not every spirit. So what we've learned from chapter 3, we learned that Satan is active. Satan is hatred. We've seen that in the children of the devil as one son in the Bible, one brother in the Bible, Cain. So, moving on, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Now, just, we're warned again, false prophets, deceivers. And God is telling us, when we come across something in our life, we can't just latch on to it and say, okay, it's good. Because there is many spirits in this world. First of all, there's a man's spirit. We read, uh, it's in one of the Life of the Kings, we read that there's a lion spirit. There's an unholy spirit. There's the Holy Spirit. There's a spirit of divination. And with all this world for written to Christians, Given the measure of the correct Bible that we're to have, I say correct Bible because you got a whole Bible, I mean holes, got holes in it. You don't have the truth. I'll tell you another spirit that comes very remarkable for this passage and for a Christian. It's called the Christmas spirit. What is the Christmas spirit? Let's look at that one just real quick. Isn't it time that we must give gifts to people? We have to gather around. And yet, this one time in the year, it's also the Christian spirit that many people will commit suicide. What is it about Christmas that brings so much joy and yet brings so much for someone to want to kill themselves? There's a spirit there is a spirit attached to Christmas. And Christmas is anti-Bible. It has nothing to do with the Bible. So one of them spirits is Christmas. And John, through the Holy Spirit, tells us, don't believe every one of them. Try them out. Study to show thyself to prove unto God a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Find out that spirit, what spirit it is. Is it a lion spirit? You know it's not of God. Four places tell us that God cannot, will not, and never will lie to us. John 8, 44 tells us who the liar is. We've seen the previous chapter about hatred. You got hatred. Well, what spirit is that? And you got to come to the conclusion there's two spirits as there's two children. Is it a spirit of God or is it a spirit of Satan? What's behind it? Is it God or Satan? Now, there's many spirits of God and there's many spirits of Satan. And Satan's an imitation of God. We're going to see in a minute. you got to be very careful with Satan because Satan will make it look good. Satan will make it look godly. Modern Bibles, they look like a Bible. They smell like a Bible. They look like a Bible, but they're not a Bible. And the spirit of a modern Bible is in the hands of a man, not the Holy Spirit. Would God take his word, as I was talking to my wife tonight, would God take his word and cut it in pieces and add to it? And No, he wouldn't. 
So how can you profess a modern Bible to be of God? It downright it causes confusion. Does God do offer confusion? No, he's not. So it can't be a holy spirit, a godly spirit. It's got to be unholy. Hereby we know, hereby know ye the spirit of God. That's the spirit of God. In the tribulation, the great tribulation, in the time of Jacob's throne, there's going to be an unholy spirit. So we know the spirit of God. Every spirit, well, it's got to be more than one. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. So you got to ask yourself, first question. Spirit? I think of this in my life. Do you profess Jesus Christ is coming to flesh? That's a question you got to ask yourself. Whatever you think God wants you to do in your life, you got to say, hey, do you profess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh? Every spirit that confesses not, every spirit. So there are more than one spirit. So when you get into religion, as in the New Age movement, ooh, spirits, God is in the trees, God is in the rock. Do you see that in the Bible? Do you really see that in the Bible? I've seen his angel. All right, the Bible says there are angels. Yep, it does. All right, what is this angel doing? Now, see, you may focus, okay, let's say you got something in your, your, in your life, you're looking at, uh, you got to find, okay, let's say angels. Oh, well, the Bible says there's an angel. You can't stop there. Now, what's the angel profess? Does he profess Jesus Christ is coming to flesh? What is that angel telling you to do? Oh, he wants me to be famed and, and show the picture of Jesus on toe. It wants me to worship, the, you know, <clears throat> Mary in heaven. Or he wants me to, no. The angel in the Bible, the spirit of an angel, as we saw, seen with Cornelius, as we see with the Revelation and the book of Revelation, John, that angel is going to say, go get yourself a man, a man that will show you Jesus Christ. Show you Jesus Christ the way of salvation. That angel must tell you that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh. I can't say anything more. I am not powered by, by God to do that. But this man knows about Jesus Christ. That man knows about the gospel. You go get him. If that angel tells you anything else, now you're dealing with another spirit that's unholy. And you can do that with drinking, what you want to drink. You can do that with food, what you want to eat. You can do that with, with smoking. You can do that with lying. You can do that with your career choice. What's it say about God in the Bible? Oh, I, I just got to offer a job to, to work for a topless bar. Really, what does God say about nudity? Boom. That's not the Spirit of God telling you to go work there, is it? Right there. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. So there are spirits out there that will deny Jesus Christ. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. So the Antichrist is here. Oh, no. Not the Antichrist. Every Christian is, is lavishing and, and drooling over and can't receive the mark. The Antichrist is already here. There are many churches that have a non-Jesus spirit that proclaims Jesus Christ as the Lord. As my Savior, virgin born, came in the flesh. That is God. Whereof ye have heard that it should come. All right, what come? Now we're going to focus ourselves on the false prophets of verse 1. Those false prophets that are going out in the world are Antichrist. And wherever you are in your Christian growth, you've got to realize they're in religion. Be it 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul tells us that they're even in the pulpits, they're Satan's ministers. 
okay? They are not of God's spirit because they teach and do things contrary to the word of God. That man you want to listen to out of the pulpit, whether television, radio, or you go to a local church assembly. Let me advise you when we're talking about spirits here, just because that man is preaching behind the pulpit, because he holds a King James Bible or another Bible, don't you take for granted that he is saved and working for God. You gotta try him out. You gotta give him years. You gotta sit under him for years and listen to what he says. I've sat years under many pastors and I listen to him, I listen to him, and then all of a sudden their lies, their lies start coming through. They're true doctrines. When you be sitting underneath a preacher, when he's reading to you, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase, I can't get it correct. Uh, out of uh, John chapter 14, he says, there'll be many rooms. What, what, what spirit's that? My Bible says mansions. Something wrong. There's another spirit that out of the pulpit, they'll say, in the Greek, in the Hebrew. That's another spirit. Yeah. Or they'll start lying. They'll tell stories. And then later on, their stories don't match with the stories they said before. I can think of one man right now. I'm out of that church. Man, his stories just did not start to sound right. And my wife and I, we, she start talking to me, say, you know, that doesn't sound right. And I listened, and I listened, and found him to be a false teacher. Their conduct. I want you to realize that Bibles and, and pastors and Sunday school teachers and people, who they're not all who they are. Now, there are great ones out there. There are wonderful ones. But we're to try them. Because look, even now already is it in the world. You know what John's telling us as Christians in this letter? To little children, to young men, to fathers. Stop looking for the Antichrist. Look for Antichrist. Because they're in you right now and you may be sitting under one. You may have one come knocking on your door. When they come knocking at your door, ask them one question. And this will first will decide, all right, is Jesus Christ God and God Jesus Christ? Don't fight them in your house. We'll see that in 2 John. And when they say no, we'll say, let's go over to Acts chapter 20, 28 and say, well, did Jesus shed his blood? And then you read Acts 20, 28. And they still deny the fact you got an evil spirit at your door. You got somebody comes to your door and says, anything but the blood of Jesus will save you. You got another spirit at that door. If you got somebody comes to you and say, just say this prayer and you can be saved, that's another spirit. That's a spirit of impatientness. Ye are of God, right into Christians, little children. So we can be fooled. If John the Beloved of Jesus Christ is right in this, right the, the greatest gospel, the, the book of Revelation, in his first, second, third epistle, if he's writing to Christians, that you can be deceived and you have to try the spirits, and then you walk off thinking, well, I don't have to, everything saved. You're bound for a fall because John's warning that that is what this chapter is about. That's what chapter 3 was about. Ye are of God. And that goes back to we're the sons of God, little children. And have overcome them. Who? The, the, the spirits and the false teachers that are already around. You know, if God would open up our eyes to the spirit world around us, you you would have a heart attack. I think when you get a drunk that has the DTs and all that, I really think they're seeing something in the realm of evil and wicked and, and spirit world. I really do. I've heard some wild stories. I've never been that far, thank God. But Satan is not going to show up with a little red guy with a pitchfork. He'll show up with a guy who wears his collar on backwards. He'll show up with a guy in a suit carrying a black Bible. And he'll try to deceive you. 
And you've got to find out who he is. Because greater is he, God, that's in you, than he, the spirits and the false teachers that are in the world. They're great. God is greater than they are. And if you are his son, and you want to do right, and you read your Bible daily, God will show you them. When you try those spirits, God will lighten them. And when you show that light, they'll be like a cockroach. They'll run away. Ooh, where'd he go? I'll tell you another way you can try those spirits. I've had this happen. Let's let's take out our Bibles and open our Bibles. I did that with a woman one day that, that came to the door, and she ripped her pamphlet information out of my hand and ran out. I'm running after her with a Bible. I am chasing this woman. You ask my wife. I'm chasing her with a Bible. I guess I know what spirit she was of. If you love the Lord and you really want to, even as a little child, is God so loving for you that he gave his only begotten son? Is God so loving that he's giving you the ability to be adopted into his family? He's going to give you a mansion, and if you do good, he'll, he'll give you an inheritance, but he's going to let you be thrown to the wolves when Christ warned us about the wolves? Now, don't. Go about and say, well, I'm not going to read my Bible. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to study. I'm not going to. Okay, then you go ahead and fall. But I don't care if you read two books of the Bible. If you're reading those two books of the Bible and you just got saved and you want to do well and you got your heart set, hey, I'm going to live for God. Two books of the Bible, God's going to show you. Keep out. Watch for those people. Don't, don't deal with those people. This is not the church you should be in. That person should be not someone you'd be hanging around with. That you ought not be doing in your life. God will show you. Ask any Christian that's grown. God is wonderful. And it can be a person, place, or thing. It could be a noun. A proper noun or a regular noun. They, the spirits of the false teachers, are of the world. Right, there you go. That, that's one warning right there. We are not of the world. The Bible says, Marvel not, the world hates you. They, therefore, speak they, the spirits of false teachers, of the world. <coughs> and the world heareth them. Alright, so these people, these false teachers, now we're going to chapter in verses five and six. I won't say chapter. In verses five and six, all right. What's another test for false teachers? Who is their captive audience? Okay. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. That's it. Who is listening to that person that you're trying to listen to? No dedicated, honest, Bible-believing Christian is going to be on television. They wouldn't allow it. If you do find one on the radio, he's going to be one man of 24, 36, 48, whoever is on that day. He's going to be in the minority. Now, watch this. Now, we see here, Spirit of Truth. Now, for those who read your Bible, who would that be? Who's the only truthful one in the Bible? Jesus, God. I am the way. Now, this is where you get to know the Scripture. I am the way. Boom. I'm the truth. God cannot lie. He will not lie. And is unable to lie. Three places in the Bible. So, that Spirit right there has to be God. Here's another spirit, and the spirit of error. Does God err? Does Jesus do wrong? Will the Holy Spirit ever say, oops, I'm sorry? So now what you do is you go into your Christian life. I don't care what age you are in Christ. You guys think, okay, there's truth out there and there's error. And somebody who wants to succeed in life, I'm going to go after the truth. I don't want error. And we got to try the captive audience of who 
is following that person. And a lot of times, if, if it's a pastor in a church, you can walk. And a lot of times, you can just feel that spirit in that church. There's something wrong here. You walk in the church, and he's got drums and electric guitar, and, and you know they get up there and they sing. They're making love to the microphone. That's gotta go. And you know the music is so loud and blaring it burns your ears. You got this get to go. The guy gets up there and he's got his collar on backwards. He's wearing a dress like a woman. You gotta go. If if a woman gets behind that pulpit, well, what's the Bible say? You gotta go. You gotta go. So see, some things are easier than others, and some spirits are gonna take a lot of prayer. It's gonna take a lot of trying. Beloved. It'd be great to have someone who loves you behind that pulpit and really cares for you. Because he'll help you. In times of trouble and need, he should be there. I've had a couple pastors turn on me. I've seen their ministries. Beloved. That's a remarkable word. This is John writing. Jesus called him the beloved disciple. And John takes that word and says it to us. This is the disciple that probably heard the heartbeat of God. Never mind Chevrolet. God. And he passes that to us. I've got the same relationship that John had with Jesus. That's remarkable. Let us love one another. There it is again, chapter 3. For love is of God. We won't talk about that here. Verse 8 will. But love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. New birth. So what you got when you got born again? You got love. And knoweth God. So if you have not been born by the new birth of God, you don't know God. You don't have love. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Okay, now let's take this as a fact. Who have been the two people of importance in chapter 3 and chapter 4? It's been God and Satan. So let's wait, wait it out. If God is love, and don't quote that on billboards, and God is love. Okay, God is love. That's what the Bible says. Honest, true statement. So what is the, the opposite being that we've learned in 3 and 4? Satan, the devil. So if God is love, what is Satan? Hey. So if you've never been born again and you are a child of the devil, and you say, oh, sweetheart, I just love you so much. Let me carve love in, in, the, in the branch of that tree. Let me just send you a valentine heart of love. He does not know what love is. Because he said God is love, and you can't know love if you don't know God. You are of you are of your father Satan. There is no attribute of love of God. You have no idea what love is until you come to Christ and God. So unsaved per I mean saved person, you are involved with an unsaved person. This is the fact that should be broken off. When he says, the unsaved person says to the saved, I love you. You don't know what love is, buddy. Because you're not saved. All you know is lust. From Satan. Satan's love is not God's love. Because Satan has no love. So all these songs and all these programs played out on television... I love you, babe, and babe, oh, I just love you, I just love you. No, to Satan, it's just a word of no value, because how many sluts in Hollywood has used the word love, how many idiots behind a microphone has sung about love, and they don't care nothing. My wife tells me she loves me. She took care of my my foot when it was injured, and gross duties had to do with, with doing my foot. That's love. That's action. That's sacrifice. I could turn the radio on right now and hear someone say, I love you. 
Really? You ain't never coming home to my house. It's just a word to Satan. But to God, it's, man, I love you. What's that love for? I'm praying for you. I want to help you. What can I do for you? I want to be around you. God is love. Satan's not love. And if you are born of God, you are love. You know what love is. And this was manifested. That's a, that's a remarkable word in, this, in John. Manifest. It's to be made known. Multiple outlets. You know, when, when you got an engine and the manifest, the manifold is put on that, that car, it comes out to more than just one hole. Manifest. Made known the love of God toward us. All right, what's this? Because that God sent his only begotten son matches John 3.16, matches 1 John 3.16. Because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. God's love brings life. God's love brought Jesus Christ. What has Satan brought to you that you may be saved? Go on, name it. Nothing. Because he doesn't love you. He's going to give you torment, tormenting, and torments. That's what he's going to give you. Is that really love? Would a woman so dare... I don't know. Man, I'm walking the background on this one. But would a woman so dare before marrying a man, a man beats her and insults her? Would she continue to marry him? Seeing that there's no hope, that there's no care, there's no concern, I, I would throw none. But that's what Satan's offering his people. I want to get you a place where you're going to be tormented for all eternity. That's not love. God says, I want to bring you a place where there's peace. I'll give you a new body. I'll give you sinlessness. I'll wipe away all those tears. I'll give you no more pain. I can't even fathom that, that love that God's going to give me. I can't even picture. I'm going to get those things. I can't fathom that love. I would not know what it's going to be like to be sinless. I would not know what it's going to be like to have no more pain. My tooth hurts now. And I would even assume, I'm assuming this because I don't know about heaven. I may never know what pain is, never more even reference back. To, I don't know if I can remember pain. My wife is having great, serious pains with her pancreas. When she gets to glory one day, she may be like, she may not have a reference point. I don't know. Maybe maybe God will give us, remember what this was like? Oh, gee, thank you, Lord. I don't know. How about God's going to give me a place that everything I do will be without sin? Everything. Look, smell, taste, everything. I will not ever have to question. I will never have to do 1 John 1, 9 ever again. Or I can I can go the other route, which I can't because I'm saying. But I can go the other route. I can go swim in a flame all eternity and burn and pain and agonize and hate and do it darkness. I can do that. While meanwhile, Satan's children said, "I love you, I love you, I love you, I love." You. Doesn't even know what it means. You know what rock and roll suggests as love. Rock and roll is a term that, that was coined, uh, I think one of the states, doesn't matter. It was coined for the fact is what a male and a female does in the back seat of a car. That's Satan's love. And it's never even told us if those two people ever got married. I don't know why they would be back seat of a car if they weren't married. They figured they'd have a marriage bed. Uh-huh. You don't know, didn't know that, did you? So, I'm so excited about the word. This is manifest the love of God. Read it again. Toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world. That he might live through, the, through him. You know what's going to happen to the world when Satan sends his son? It's called Jacob's Trouble. Read the book of Revelation. That's really love with Satan. Here it is love. Alright? Not that we love God. Now I grew up as a Roman Catholic and I feared God. Honestly, I did. And there was a lot of things I never understood. But you know what happened? 
you know what never happened between a child in April 1987? If I could say I love God, I never did what God told me to do. I did not seek God through Jesus Christ. So I cannot say even fearing God. I can say I can never say. Well, I searched for God because if I had searched for God, I would have found Him. Can you see God hiding behind a tree? One Mississippi, two Mississippi. Oh, God, I love you. Just keep on hiding. I'll come and get you. No. Here it is, love that, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation that is the appeasing for our sins. God says, I am wrathful at you. I hate you. I want to throw you and your sins in hell because I am a holy. You have no business coming in front of me. Son, go down there and die for their sin because I love them. I'm long-suffering. I don't want them to go to hell. They deserve it. But I want them to be with me. Now, what greater love is there? Like I said, my wife's got great pains. I've heard many people say with the pancreas that that is one of the great pains that are in life as much as giving birth. The tribulation period is always referenced to a woman that's about to give birth. <laughs> that tells you something about the pain and tribulation when God, the Creator, says, I like it into a woman in great travail. Great travail. Again, I can't even fathom the pain that Jesus had the last 24 hours. When you read what the Bible did to him, the people, Roman soldiers, the elite of the elite, and Jesus Christ suffered, suffered, and died a painful, miserable death. And you're going to sing on the radio, oh, I love you. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. True. We're a family. No man has seen God at any time. Some people say they do. What's that verse say? If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. Oh, hold on here. Hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's go back. We've studied every book of the Bible so far from Genesis to 1 John. We have learned that the Holy Spirit indwells in me. He's in my heart. He moved in the day I got saved. He's my comforter. We have also learned, surprisingly by Paul, that Jesus Christ indwells in me. John, you're telling me that God also dwells in me? You mean I got the Holy Trinity, the Godhead, that is dwelling inside of me. Now, the next time you sin, think about that. Whatever your sin is. Think about what you're subjecting God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to. Think he's pleased? Well, look at that. You know, you, you are one of those schizophrenias, I think is what they call it. You have got a personality... Of five people in you you've got God the Father God the Son God the Holy Spirit you've got your old nature the flesh and you got yourself I want to do right but <laughs> this flesh this flesh can overpower the Godhead that's why God's got to give us a new one that's why most times put it in a grave that's the only way you're going to stop this body. Hereby know we that we dwell in him. We're dwelling in him. He's dwelling in us. Paul says we are seated in heavenly places. And he in us. Because he has given us his spirit. There's the Holy Spirit dwelling in me. An ambassador, a representative of God the Father is in me. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. John and the eleven disciples. 
three and a half years they lived, ate, and ministered around about and with Jesus Christ. 1 John 1 1. This is a testimony you could take to a courtroom. It cannot be refuted. All right, take Judas out. All right, we know what happened to Judas. Let's take him out of them all. Let's take the ten disciples alone. No. Let's take the three disciples. Peter, James, and John. They're the ones that got the elite with Jesus Christ. According to Jewish law, let's go by the Jewish Bible. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, it shall be established. Before a Jewish people, before a Jewish synagogue, you can call these Jewish men, Peter, James, and John, and say, we've seen Jesus Christ in the, live in the well, and their law says, you must believe him. How's that? Every one of those Jews that rejected Jesus Christ in the book of Acts went in a violation of the law, and that made them guilty. The law is a schoolmaster to show you're a sinner. You ever notice they travel two by twos, if not by three? That was the law. Oh, we follow the law. Well, we're two people, and we're testifying as witnesses of Jesus Christ. Your law says you have to you have to approve of us. Especially the news of Jesus was already scattered around. It was the modern news of the time. Come on, if, if the fact is that Jesus is healing lepers and making people blind and now see, and maniacs and, and devils are coming out of people, and he's feeding 4,000 people with, with, what was that, a piece of bread? A two bread? Well, I don't remember that. Let's make it worldwide news in the known world. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. But the world, Christ came to save the world, but the free will of the world is, I can take it or leave it. I can go the broad way or I can go the, the straight gate. So God has given every man opportunity to be saved. But the free will of man says, I want it or I don't want it. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. So there again. It's a confession. If you're not guilty, if you're not a sinner, you don't confess nothing. And then we come over here, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, it's called repentance. It's called admitting our faults. There can be no pardon given if you are not guilty. So if the President of the United States went into a prison today and he held in his hands papers saying, I will pardon, and you put the name on there, signed by, I almost forgot his name. I did forget his name. Donald Trump. And if he went to a prisoner and say, are you guilty of any crime? Oh, no, no. I'm, and listen, I've had prisoners say, I've had a whole room of prisoners in a jailhouse. Man, I said, it, who in this room is not guilty? Every single hand went up. And they would give that reaction to the President of the United States. He said, sorry, I can't give you a pardon. Next, have you been guilty of? No, I have not. But if somebody says, yeah, I'm guilty. I've done wrong. Then an issue of a pardon can be given. God is not going to pardon you. God is not going to let you into heaven unless you admit, unless you confess, you are the sinner. God does not save holy people. He saves sinners. And we know, no, I, we know, we know. Whosoever shall confess Jesus Christ is the Son of God. God dwells in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has, has to us. God is love. Three times. And he that dwells in love. Well, look at that. God now becomes the attribute of what he is. He said, God is love. So he that dwells in love. 
Not only is God love, but God is love. You understand what I'm trying to say? He is his character. He is his attribute. It ain't just a word to God. That's his being. And then, again, if you use the word love just passionately, I mean, just occasionally, passionately, you use it to make money, you use it to... Do you realize those people are going to stand before God who is love and have to give an account what you did with his attribute? Every time a Hollywood person who is... Any time any unsaved person uses the word love, he's going to have to give an account because he doesn't know what love is, and love is God. Some people at the Great White Throne Judgment, glad time has stopped because we're going to be there for a while. Jesus said, I can't remember this chapter, but we shall give an account of every idle word. Imagine every time someone uses the word love I, idly. They will give an account because that is God. When you think of love, think of God. That's what he is. Think of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is love and he that dwells in love dwelleth in God and God in him. There is that indwelling spirit. You can't lose your salvation. Once you enter that straight gate, it's shut. You can't go out. Here it is our love made perfect. Oh, you can have a perfect love. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. Now at the day of judgment, the lost are going to tremble. But not those that are saved and know what that love is. Gonna be like, oh, that's my father. That's, oh, that's who I've been looking for. That's the blessed. Oh, I. Oh yes, thank you, Lord. John says, even so, come, Lord Jesus. That time when when God comes, Jesus is no. It'll be like, thank you, Jesus, for coming. Imagine what the world is gonna be when Jesus comes on that horseback. It says they're gonna hide in dens and caves. They're gonna throw their idols away. They're gonna be in fear. Not me. The people of the world are going to fear when Jesus comes. There is no fear in love. Again, that little boy. He, take, he steals a cookie, he breaks the window. Why is he not going to go run and tell dad and mom? I'm going to spank him. I'm going to get it. They're going to, they're going to do something to me. They're going to take my mom's way. And that's what fear does. Fear and love do not go together. There is no fear in love. So you won't be ashamed to admit you're a sinner before God. But perfect love, you want perfected love, casteth out fear. Because, or yeah, because fear has torment. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Here? What's going to be? What's going to be? Oh, I don't know. Oh, got to have a pill. Got to get a tranquilizer. And when I go over here to 2 Timothy, let me go over here real quick. Let me read you something, what Paul tells us. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. We're just talking about spirits, weren't we? There's another spirit out there. It's called fear. God has not given you that spirit. I'm afraid of heights. That did not come from God. But of power and love. Oh! How did Paul know what John's going to write? And how did John know what Paul's going to write? For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. That's what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Which matches what John has said. Fear is not of God. Now you have godly fear. You have reverential fear for God. You don't want to be caught in your sins. That's a perfect fear. That's reverence to holy God. But any other fears, it makes you 
torment makes you un uneasy, makes you unrelaxed. And then you don't have love. He that fears is not made perfect in love. So fear makes you short of love. We love him. Now get this. Because he first loved us. Now there are many people, oh I just love Jesus. Do you really know what Jesus has done for you? Do you really know the love of God? That's what this chapter says. And to realize that I love Christ because he loved me. It had nothing to do with me. Until after I came to Christ. Then that love happened. There was no love before Christ came in your life again. You can't know love until you know Christ. So anybody who is not saved has no love. You got an uns unsaved couple, they stand before an altar to be in marriage, there's no love. If a man say, oh, you're going back at it again, I love God, and hated his brother, he is a liar. Ooh. I didn't think that was a lie. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he has seen, you see your brother in the Lord. How can he love God whom he has not seen? Eyes and behold of the, the seer. Oh, I love God. You never seen God. How about another child of God? Well, I don't like him. I hate him. They're in bad ground there. And this commandment have we from him, God, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. Like I said, some Christians out there, they, they irritate me. It's just, just two different, I don't hate them. I don't, I pray for them when, they, when there's need in their life. I, I probably got their name in my Bible somewhere. But there are people, this extreme hatred, I don't want to be there because of that person. I don't want to do anything because of that person. And that's not a right spirit. Hating is a spirit. And I guarantee what we read in this chapter, since God is loved and Hate is not of God. You got an unholy spirit. Whatever your reason is, it's an unholy spirit. 